Welcome to Theo Trade the weekend update here on July 1st, 2017, heading into the week, of course, of July 4th, where we're going to have some altered trading hours. It's one of the things I'll kick this video off with. First and foremost, if you're uh, unaware, of course, on July 4th, U.S. markets officially are closed. There are limited futures trading hours. In addition to that, on July 3rd, we have a limited trading session into which the marketplace, the equity marketplace, will close at 12 noon central time. So what does that really leave us with is about three and a half days of trading in this coming week. Now, I'll mention that a little bit later in this video as it does have very, very large impacts in terms of implied volatility and what we can expect this next week. Again, everybody's anticipating some holiday trade. However, even on Friday, we saw fairly heavy volume inside of markets uh, and even a sell-off uh, late in the trading session, of course, on Friday. So let's get to it. Let's do a, a quick kind of week uh, in review, and then we're going to be, again, very forward-looking on here as we look towards this July 4th holiday weekend. First and foremost, to review the week, I, I like to start with expected moves. And for those of you, if you've now been tuning in kind of on a week-to-week -week basis over here, we look at expected moves, okay? These lines that are drawn on your screen, if you will. First and foremost, again, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing them by hand. Uh, I get this email, I don't know, 50 times a week. Everybody's like, well, where's the script for this? So I decided not to use a script to draw the expected move because I want uh, really some, some accuracy that I don't feel I can get with the script. And with the script, I would have to constantly be adjusting it. But I'm going to explain in a little bit of detail here how I draw these so the central line each week okay when i say the central line this central line each week is drawn uh precisely five days out in the future so for example i will draw it from today out until the end of course of next week it, it covers five trading days even though this is going to be a shortened week um and you can also see i will draw that central line precisely where the market closes on Friday. So it's 24, okay, 23. Then for the expected moves themselves, I happen to use the calculation and I had a lot of input over the years on the Thinkorswim platform. Of course, before TheoTrade, I spent 15 years with Thinkorswim and TD Ameritrade. I had a lot of input to the expected move and that's the calculation I'm fairly comfortable with. I happen to know a lot of big trading firms, you know, like in-house at City and Merrill, okay? They're using a very, very similar equation to this. Nevertheless, the expected move is about $24.55. You don't have to split too many hairs on there. So all you really have to do is take the price of the SPX, add 2457, subtract 2457, and that's ultimately how I draw the expected moves. And I do it by using trend lines. That's it, I just draw a trend line out into the future over there. Uh, and again, on a week to week basis, it's worth it to take the time to do so. After I draw the, the expected moves, you can also come down here on the right hand uh, side and you can now save the drawing sets and it also allows me to turn them on and turn them off. So I wanted to start with that because uh, again, I can't take the number of emails that are coming in anymore in that regard. Um, so yes, I do draw them by hand, both in the SPX and in the QQQ and we share that. You know, when, when I say share it, I just share the link. You can have all my drawings, you know, until umpteen days back over here. So I start with in this past week, we see a degree of volatility. And this is something that I've been looking at and looking for. In fact, if you tune into last week's video, I spoke specifically of the NASDAQ and we should see some 200 point moves. That's exactly what we are seeing. So one of the most important things on the expected move, and again, expected move is just based on option pricing. Option pricing, all it does is gives you a market to the future, right? So based on the option pricing over here, it said last week, all right, we're expecting about, you know, some 22 point move. Well, at one point on Thursday, we even crest through the expected move and then bounced right back in it. So one of the most important things is right up front, if you sold options in the SPX, which is exactly what 
we did this past week. We sold options in the S&Ps, okay? Uh, why did we do that? Because we had a very high likelihood of being inside the expected move, which is where we ultimately ended up. In addition to it, if you take a look at the queues, and of course I've been drawing expected move in the queues, week in and week out, you can see that the QQQ, which started, of course, started last week right here, which is just above 141, okay, got bid up, dropped hard on the week and closed well outside of its expected move. And I want to uh, just highlight an idea on here. You can see, well, I highlighted the candle that how large it closed outside of the expected move. The expected move is supposed to take us to about 139, okay? Where did we end up? All the way down here at 137.64. So why am I mentioning that? Because we've been trading ultimately by selling premium in the S&P, and we've been turning around and buying premium inside of the NASDAQ. And it's what we call our tetrapod spread. And it was really successful this past week. And we've got another one, of course, for the coming week. Now, to kind of continue forward. So volatility is on everybody's mind. And I think that they're focused a bit specifically on the NASDAQ. And I'm going to show you some interesting things in the NASDAQ here momentarily. So let me first take my drawing off. I just went back to the default chart, took some of the drawing off over here. And of course, you can see some of the volatility starting to emerge in the NASDAQ. Even, even beyond the volatility, I'm going to go now to the NASDAQ futures, and I'm going to show you what a 30-day, one hour starts to look like. So after our large volatility event, okay, when I say volatility event, I'll just zoom in here uh, kind of a little bit tighter. This is going back to about June 9th. So we see a decent sized volatility event that gripped everybody's attention over here. We've been bouncing inside of a range on the NASDAQ. And again, specifically, this is the NASDAQ futures. We've been bouncing in this range, but that range, all right, to make this very, very evident, has been all the way from 58.50 down to what? 56.50. It's this 200 point range that we're ultimately pulling S hooks in. We end up right to the bottom of the range on this week. In fact, right into the close, uh, coming into a holiday weekend, the NASDAQ made an effort to sell off hard and fast right up to that 56.50 breaking below the 56.50. Again, people are talking about support and resistance there. I'm not hugely into support and resistance. Everything in today's market, it's, it's, it's so much more quantitative, okay? But clearly and decisively, this you know 56.50 has become kind of the line in the sand in the NASDAQ. I mean, you could point out once, twice, third time, you know, maybe a fourth time, a fifth time that we've been there. Breaking below it, there's no question we're going to see some some sell side activity kind of persist if we do break below that. Of course, everybody wants, you know, the big question is, where are we headed from here? Well, again, let me show you something that I find pretty interesting on this front. So on a week to week basis, what these expected moves do is they're just a way to visually interpret implied volatility. So if you look out to this coming week, okay? The implied volatility is about 16.58. And what's interesting about that, all right, 16.58, you're like, I don't even know what that means. Okay. Well, it equates to about a $2.50 expected move. Now, for just a moment, we're going to go back in time. When I say we're going to go back in time, I want to show you, all right, ultimately, here we are today, July 1st. Let's back up, all right? to last Saturday. And I like to record these videos on Saturday so you can go from one Saturday to the next. So let me show you what last Saturday looked like so you can kind of get a good gauge of this. Last Saturday, the, uh, the implied volatility was 14.53. So in this coming week, the volatility is even higher. It's 16, okay? But here's the point. The expected move last week was $2.32. The expected move in this coming week is $2.50, but there's only three and a half trading days to the week, right? We're only really trading half of Monday. Tuesday markets are closed. Then we have Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So you can see the anticipation of risk has picked up a lot, but there's a huge but in here. If you take 
a look at, all right, from a very, very different perspective here, I'm going to come into what is implied volatility. All right. And a lot of people are familiar with implied volatility. This is looking at implied volatility. You can see implied volatility increasing over here. But where's the implied volatility? Well, the implied volatility is hanging out right in the neighborhood of about 17, 18 level. Okay. And that's, that's again, that's like the 30 day implied volatility. But there's something even more interesting in this. And I'm actually going to remove the implied volatility study. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead back up two studies. I'm going to drop down and throw up historical volatility. Okay. So I'm putting up historical volatility and then I'm going to edit historical volatility and just again, kind of bear with me here as I'm going through, I'm going to show you exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to knock historical volatility down to five days. Okay. For those of you that have no clue what historical volatility is, it's the annualized standard deviation to the past stock price movement. Ooh, that was an exciting definition that we're never going to recover from, right? Now, what historical volatility happens to be, it's looking at actual price movement. Now I've opened up three years and I want to show you in the short duration. And that's why I knocked it down to five days. In, in terms of actual price movement over the last, you know, like the previous five days, look where actual price movement is inside of the NASDAQ. And again, this is specific to the Qs. And I'm getting to something very, very important over here. If you're taking a look at this, you're saying, all right, so what does this even mean, Don? Like, I get it, right? Historical volatility, which is actual price movement, is high on a relative basis. The only times it's been higher, I mean, this was like August of, of 2015, which was an extreme event. Here, okay, we actually have Brexit. That was Brexit right there. Here, this is in the middle of a huge sell-off inside of the market. This is the taper tantrum where the both the S&Ps and the market, they, by the way, this little move right here, that took the S&Ps at the bottom. The S&Ps in 2016, go look at the chart. Okay, in January, February of 2016, they were all the way down to 1800 at that point. And here we are with volatility starting to pick up. But my point is, no, not that we're just entering a more volatile time. The point being, you have to recognize the implied volatility is being exceeded by actual price movement. What that, what that again amounts to, and I'll come back to our original chart, what it amounts to is buy options. Buy options in the NASDAQ, and that's exactly what we've been doing because the NASDAQ continues to exceed its expected moves week in and week out. And this is a really unusual stance for me to take because I really believe in very, very efficient markets. And here we have a market that continues to exceed its expected move week in and week out. Now, again, the fact that we have a limited trading week over here, I don't necessarily expect any fireworks this July, you know, uh, 4th, probably a, a bad pun in there. I don't expect any fireworks though in the marketplace uh, over the July 4th week, but the implied volatility is definitely picking up. What you're seeing though, is historical volatility, which is actual price movement, just continues to exceed the way that markets are pricing it. And that's important because, again, it allows us to sell premium in the SPX, buy premium over in the Qs, and we're not even worrying about direction at this point. Okay, we're, we're involved in non-directional trades. Now, let us talk a little bit about direction because there was a very big change in tone inside of the S&Ps. So if we take a look at the S&Ps, as they said, they stayed inside of their expected move. But specifically, I want to look at the S&P futures. Uh, and the reason I want to look at the S&P futures is I got a little bold earlier in the week and I was talking about very, very specific levels to watch. The specific levels to watch, and I keep reiterating these levels, happen to be 24, okay, 38. It's 2438 inside of the S&P futures to the upside. The downside happens to be 2411. And if you take a look at the S&P futures pinging along these, okay, ultimately that's where we started and our descent took us literally close just above 2411 with a uh, kind of a breakthrough over here and a little bit of panic almost all the way down to 2400. Keep those levels in mind as this next week progresses because it's very likely that we progress right into this 2411 ping around it. Now, I don't have any specific levels below that because quite frankly, there hasn't been a substantial amount of trade as of late 
below the 2411. Those are two, again, huge and key inflection points. Now, one of the biggest changes in tone of the marketplace, as we started to progress through the week and we started to see some of this volatility inside of the NASDAQ, the volatility did, in fact, proliferate into the S&P 500. And we saw that on Thursday, the S&Ps got serious out there for a period of time. And if, if you weren't watching, okay, you didn't see what I saw. And that is, okay, they were hitting markets hard with, uh, again, unruly amounts of volume inside of the S&P futures, which is indicative of hedging activity. The thing that I don't think a lot of people caught, though, is when I say that the, the sell side activity proliferated, what was going on is the advanced decline line, and I'm actually going to take you to the advanced decline line. Here's the S&P 100. The advanced decline line on a day-to-day -day basis inside the S&P 100, okay, has been in this kind of range. It's been this 60-40, this okay? Nothing has really had high correlation. Well, all of a sudden, when volatility kind of hit markets, we saw the advanced decline line inside of the S&P 100 specifically go to 95, basically five. And what that amounts to when it says 95, five, that's full blown correlation. It's kind of what we consider like an all down day. And we saw that in the S&P and it's one of the first times we've seen full blown correlation emerge. That is indicative of a complete change again in tone in the marketplace. And it's something that whether we go higher or lower in this next week of trade, it's something that you really need to consider. The only products, okay, that were performing well happened to be specific to the XLF, right? The XLF rallied up a little bit. There's been news, of course, about the financials. Now they're allowed to be in, you know, pay dividends, pay themselves more money. But really, was the news in the financials as big as the fact that the bonds ultimately backed off over here? And the bonds, which have been ripping higher, sold off along with the market selling off, which everybody stood back and kind of scratched their heads on there, okay? Any bid back up in the bonds, if the bonds start rallying over here, you might at that point really need to feel the fear because if the bonds turn around and start rallying, the XLF at this point in time is the only thing holding the S&Ps to 2,400. You start getting the XLF selling off in any way, shape, or form, and if these bonds rally, okay, it's bye-bye S&Ps, and the S&Ps can have, at that point, a fairly substantial drop. So when you're thinking about different sectors and so forth, again, everybody's head is in the clouds. They're all focusing on the NASDAQ. It's the XLF, though, that even in a tough week, is maintaining the bid. It's maintaining and supporting the S&P. Look at the bonds. Look at the XLF this next week. It's what's going to drive a huge amount of the trade. Now, let's get stock specific. Google. Okay. Google is at what I would consider dangling off the cliff kind of levels over here. Google really cracking under about 925. It's, it's not about Google. It's about a broader sell side activity that will again likely hit the NASDAQ and take the NASDAQ into some of the most extremes. And again, I'm trying to be as forward looking as possible over here. Don't worry about earnings. Nobody cares about earnings at this point. They're worried about the here and now. And Google is at critical mass of a level. I also want to show you something like Facebook. Why? Facebook has not been hit nearly as much as many of the other tech stocks over here. So look, if markets are going to fade, you know, when I say markets are going to fade, if the NASDAQ is going to continue to kind of sell off over here, you have to look to areas that have actually been resilient because you want to get involved in this sell off, right? So you'd want to be short something like a Facebook, which Facebook, again, it's only four or five days. Look at this. You know what? One, two, three, four. We're five trading days removed from its all-time high. And people are not picking up on this. And they're like, well, look at the NASDAQ getting crushed. Yeah, but Facebook is very, very opportunistic at this point. In comparison to Apple, which has been beaten up, Apple too is at what I would consider kind of a critical mass level. Then we got to go over here to Amazon. Amazon as well has been faring extremely well through some adversity. Now, I'm a little more reluctant to want to come in and short Amazon. 
uh, only because of my own experiences. Nevertheless, in terms of the uh, what I would call the big boys of tech, I would say that Facebook is is the most prime of those. Now, I didn't cover Microsoft. Well, that's Microsoft's actually slid from again about 73, and it's well removed on a percentage basis from its kind of uh, all time high out there. Again, Facebook's the stock to watch because if something's going to get pummeled and end up flat on its face, it's likely to be Facebook in uh, in the next wave of sell side activity. Now, to be forward looking over here, we have three and a half days of trade. And the SPX, okay, in those three and a half days of trade is sitting on almost a $24.5 move. Now, why that's so prevalent is, again, in the previous week, where we had a full week of trade, in the previous week, we only had a $22 expected move. But one of the notable things, okay, this week is that the downside expected move takes us, boom, right under 2400 So I think we should look for a test to the 2400 Okay. The other thing you want to look for and be very, very aware of in this coming week, okay, if markets get bid at the open, look for wild sell side activity and reversals. And you need to be aware of this because so many people, they've been lulled to sleep in, lo in just this low volatility climate. One of the hallmarks of volatility, okay, we've seen time and again this past week. And what's one of the hallmarks of the volatility? They're hitting the bid. And that is ultimately, you're seeing markets get bid up on the open. People, that ain't buying. That's shorts that have been covering their positions, like in the overnight trade and in the morning, they basically go out there, what do they do? They cover up the shorts, they re-up, and they hit them again. And it's also indicative of dynamic hedging. Inside of the queues, again, a fairly vast expected move range, but we only have three and a half days of trade out there. So we hit all the key points, again, correlation came into play. We saw the NASDAQ once again exceed its expected move and the volatility, of course, picking up in the NASDAQ on a day-to-day -day basis. We realize we have Google dangling from the edge of a cliff as well as Apple. Facebook's the stock to go after in a short position. If you're going to short Facebook, though, and you're worried about exploding back to the upside, use a defined risk spread. A lot to think about, again, in this holiday kind of week of trade over here, but make no two ways about it. Sure, Monday, it's a half a trading session, could be a little bit more quiet. Expect activity Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of this coming week. Expect it, because the rest of the world is going to continue to trade, and they're not going to wait. You know, people always talk about the summer and the doldrums of summer. There's nothing dull about some of the trade that we're seeing right now. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here at Theo Trade. Have a wonderful holiday weekend. Bye-bye.